Okay, good, good afternoon. Do we have everybody here? I think we'll do this. It's right. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Hi, come on in. <laughs> good. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, oh, there, there we go. I think you can see me. <laughs> yeah, I want to. Can, can you see the video on there or is it just. Go to viewer. I'll just put this down. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ag Billy Amico. You can say Ag for short. Um, I'm with uh, INCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, uh, based out of uh, Boulder. Keith Mall is not here, but I believe he is on the phone, so he may chime in um, every now and then for some comments. Um, Today, we're gonna to talk about 3D printed weather stations. Um, I'm gonna kind of give a short little uh, presentation, but then we're gonna go into sort of a free for all and just you know, pull this apart and we'll just start putting it together and get some feedback um, as to you know, the process of putting it together, the usefulness in the classrooms and things like that. Um, a couple of quick questions for everyone here. Um, how many of you guys uh, teach um, elementary, junior high um, levels, and then what about um, upper, like um, you know, secondary, high school, um, or university? Okay, uh, access to 3D printers. How do you guys? Yes. yes. So you do have access. Have you used 3D printers before? but you have used it before. Okay, so, and that's something that you guys that you think is kind of interesting. Did you like it or how did you yeah. feel? Okay, okay, good. Um, so yeah, so basically what we're gonna talk about, this is, uh, uh, can you hear me okay? Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So we're gonna talk about participatory design um, of an IoT to explore hardware, software, and data needs for um, community-based, uh, community-driven decision making. So, really, what we're going to do is I'm going to give a background, and I really want to get everybody real roll up our sleeves and start playing with the with the radiation shield, just so we see how how it all works, and and actually hold a 3D printed part and see um, see how that how that goes. Um, so what are 3D printed weather stations? I mean, weather stations are obviously a necessary tool to, um, to collect data and to, to make observations of, uh, you know, of the weather. And weather, um, weather stations is a critical component in weather forecast. You have to make an observation before you take that observational data and use it to make a forecast. So that's one of the things we're uh, trying to, um, to communicate. Professional grade, stations um, that are at airports and whatnot, they're very costly or often pretty quite costly. Um, they're also not trivial um, to configure. Um, you know, of course, a lot of the ones require soldering and a lot of other um, quite technical um, things to, to put together. And so part of what we're trying to do is to, is to reduce those technicalities. Um, personal weather stations, are definitely proliferating. They're becoming everywhere. You can go to different stores and like Walmart or, or Office Depot and whatnot and purchase a weather station, Amazon and buy a weather station. The only issue there is that you're often, uh, they're often built on proprietary and very inflexible programs. In other words, yes, you can go and buy a, a, a cheap weather station, but then the ability to access the historical data and have control or sovereignty over your data is, that's where, you know, that's where they, uh, that's where the bait and switch is basically. Um, integration uh, into many diverse uh, community uh, uh, user cases and community cases. And what we'd like to do is really develop a low cost, sort of flexible and open source platform and when we say open source we mean a platform that can be used um, where the hardware you can 3d print the hardware there are also 3d print services so that if you don't want to 3d print 
um, it yourself, you can spend twenty, thirty dollars, for example, for the radiation shield. Have somebody else print it and mail it to you. Um, that those are other sort of options, but you have the option to have the files, either print them yourselves or have somebody else print them or go to a makerspace and have a makerspace, you know, work with people at makerspaces and have them printed there. So you have various different options and that's what we'd like to do. Um, we'd also like to accommodate, um, you know, education and educational uses for the, 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 the weather stations. And of course, citizen science. So citizen scientists and students, um, people at home would like to, to have a weather data and weather um, information, but also be able to customize things. Um, this is what this platform is, is, is we're designing to, to do, is to have a level of flexibility that it can be used in uh, multiple case studies. Uh, lastly, we'd like to accommodate new measurements, um, instruments, and um, and encourage and stimulate uh, communities and teachers and citizen scientists to share ideas and to um, and and to, and to help maybe perhaps share data and, and and help figure out how climate impacts and weather impacts them by actually having tools to uh, monitor these things. Um, we're looking at you see this term IoT. And you may have heard this term before. A lot of people, you have Alexa at home. You see the commercials with all these, you know, appliances talking to you, talking to you and doing other types of things like that. And the Internet of Things for weather um, was kind of inspired previously by a, 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 the professional grade systems, which are pulled all together um, as one sort of system. So you couldn't build. You'd have to build a whole entire weather station with, you know, all the different pieces together at once and what we're trying to do is make it where each part is a module or a node and each node you can build separately so one classroom session you might build one node like today we're going to build we're going to I'm going to take this uh, radiation shield apart and we're going to put that together and play with that today and that could be one classroom session and in another classroom session you might build a wind vane or a wind gauge uh, another classroom session you could do a rain bucket and, and and determine rain so if you live in Hawaii you'd probably be very interested in the rain situation versus if you live in Arizona you might be much more interested in the radiation shield and how hot it is and what the pollution levels are and some of those types of things. So we want to have um, and encourage sort of a broad educational engagement. Um, we also want to encourage other areas of the national um, science standards, the NGSS standards. In other words, you know, there are things like programming and, and engineering and those things. You can kind of go down as deep as you want or stay very high level. And that's kind of what we'd like to do with this is that, you know, we keep it at a very high level. You can put it together click and play, but then at the, at the same time, if you have other uh, grades that are, are, you know, senior to, uh, to that, you can actually drill down and do and engage students depending on what level you would like to, um, to work with them on. Um, so I'm just going to do this real quick just so you can see a picture of it. This is what uh, the older the original version of the weather station looked like when they were deploying this station in um, Kenya. And they've done, you know, NCAR, um, National Center for Atmospheric Research, they've done multiple deployments of this uh, station and it was based off of a Raspberry Pi. And I can show you an example of Raspberry Pi just so we can start getting a little bit of uh, background. This is a Raspberry Pi. I'm going to pass this around. And that's just a mini um, computer, actually. And, and, and the mini computer, a Raspberry Pi, um, it has a whole operating system running on it, just like your computer that you have on your laptop. It runs an entire operating system. Um, but of course, you know, that things get quite complicated there. So what this has wiring and it has like a central nervous system that's all wired together and requires a lot of soldering and whatnot. So that was sort of the original design that sort of inspired what um, what we're trying to um, what we're testing out now in terms of a new more modular um, design. So what we're trying to do with why sort of an Internet of Things sort of idea is we would like to reduce the learning curve by eliminating, uh, you know, soldering and sort of wiring skills so that we're not having to spend a lot of time figuring out if you look at the, um, the 
uh, Raspberry Pi that's floating around, you'll see it has these pins that stick out of it. And usually you have to have the wires connect onto the pins and there's all that sort of complicated um, you know, electronics. And we're trying to eliminate those issues and go to more of a microcontroller sort of system, which I'll explain in a minute here. Um, we would like to have um, fewer 3D printed parts than the huge other station that they had previous that we had previously, and then sort of um, uh, easier connectors for the for the wires. So, for example, we have and we will see these connectors. We'll have these uh, sort of wires here, and these wires are called Grove connectors. And you'll see these Grove connectors actually have pre-built um, plugs on them so that you can click them in to the sensor without actually having to solder. Obviously getting a soldering iron into a classroom, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how, how, how that would how that would fly. <laughs> so so we're trying to eliminate those types of issues. And also a lot of the other tooling because a lot of times, you know, other tools like, you know, wire cutters and clippers and all kinds of things like that. Um, not only do they cost money, but they also have post safety and other kinds of issues that um, you know that obviously teachers have to keep track of. So that, especially in the classroom, so that's something. Um, so we also have a, a code repository. This is one of the areas where we're really trying to. Um, we're not going to dive into this today. We're not going to get into any of the coding things. So let's not. <laughs> don't worry about that yet. But that's one of the areas. I think today we're going to focus on physically putting this thing together, and not so much about the coding stuff. But what we'd like to do with the coding is a quick download and flash of the microcontrollers and that's how it will be so that there's not a lot of actual coding unless you want to go down that road you can then go and code but in a 40 minute classroom session you won't have time to like do coding you just want to be able to like flash it or order it pre-loaded um, and then you'd be able to just plug and play without having to deal with that um, so uh, basically what we're doing is we're reimagining the um, weather station as a an interconnection of different nodes. So if you look here at this current system that's sitting here, you have, and I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this off. Hopefully this doesn't make too much noise. You have, hold on. Okay. So you have two, you have two of the nodes here. This node here is called, we're, we're calling it the arrow node. It's called a radiation shield and basically like incoming solar radiation from the sun. That's why they call it a radiation shield. So that's the term. Um, and basically it's, it's shaped like this so that it can catch the a ambient air temperature and, and basically it'll capture the air temperature, pressure, relative humidity and, okay, hold on, let me switch mic. Okay, that might make life easier for me. Thanks. Can you hear me? Okay, good. So, it, so this captures temperature, relative humidity um, and, and pollution. So you can get like uh, pollution measurements out of that. This node here is called the uh, the wind. Uh, so basically, this will capture wind. Uh, this captures wind speed here, and then this captures wind direction. Um, you can also add another node for rain. You can add another node for um, what else do we got? We can like light, for example. You can have a camera on there. If you have a question, oh, hold on. What kind of pollution? Uh, yeah, so it has a different sort of uh, sensors. One is a um, just CO2 uh, concentrations, uh, and the other one just calculate like looked at uh, particulates in the air and just sort of give you various different concentrations. Uh, it, do, it does not include lead, at least initially. That one does not include lead, but there are other sensors that you can do to measure. Um, various other things. So you may have in a classroom situation, because we have nodes like this, you might say, okay, what's another thing that would be interesting to kids or, or schools or communities? One thing you might want to add a camera onto this system. And if you have just a simple camera on here, the camera could be looking up. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, she asked, a, that's a very good question. The question was, what about noise? That's another good one. You could add a microphone sensor, and the microphone sensor could be looking at noise pollution, or it could be looking at you know when it rains or when a storm comes, 
obviously you have a certain ambient noise and you could use that. So there are lots of different ideas and what this platform does is by having them separated into separate nodes, you can kind of create your own um, node or your own concept and that node would be your weather station or your environmental sensor. So you don't have to have all of the nodes done all at once. And if one piece, if one node breaks or something's wrong with one node, you can take that node off or you can replace that node with another node and you're not tied to a whole interconnected system. So that's sort of the idea that we're trying to, to work with. And of course, some classroom sizes, depending on the schools and the, and the, the teachings and whatnot, could be you know 50 minute classroom session or it could be a 90 minute session or however long the different um, classroom sessions are. We're trying to make the nodes and the manuals, the instruction guides short enough so that, that you can handle it within one uh, classroom session. And of course, with multiple people in the classroom, it takes wrangling and <laughs> all of that to get um, in coordination just to get everybody, you know, things together. So that's kind of why we'd like to do this uh, node approach. Um, and then, of course, lastly, the last point on here is the, the, you know, there's communications, which these things, if you're in the classroom, you might be on a Wi-Fi, but if you're out in the field, you may not exactly have Wi-Fi um, readily available, so you might have to use cellular communications and other things. But for now, we're not going to concern ourselves with that in this session. We're going to start putting these things together. Um, let me go to the next slide. Is that, is that working? There we go. So a last thing is on, another thing is on one of the nodes is we have a compute node. And part of the compute node is one of the groups here at, uh, at NCAR they're working on where does weather forecast come from? And that is, and this is just kind of a cool um, concept of saying, you know, we have these Raspberry Pis. These Raspberry Pis can actually run weather forecasts. So in other words, you make an observation you take that observation and you put that observation inside of a weather model, which is called the WRF model, the Weather Research Forecast model. And it's got a little graphical user interface that you see here. And you pick the size of the domain around your city, around your community. And then the model runs all these numbers and comes out, for example, with a nice forecast. So the idea here is not necessarily how accurate and great the model is per se, because you're not running on a supercomputer. But the idea here is to show that this is where weather forecasts come from. They come from making observations, taking those observational data and running some sort of model or forecast. And that's where the guy on TV or the lady on TV, who's the meteorologist, um, they're reporting that data. And this is what the National Weather Service does is that they collect data and from weather stations and satellites and they use that data to create uh, forecasts and make um, and help people make sort of decisions. So um, so there are various different use cases. I won't get into that too much today because I mean we are, you guys are the use case <laughs> today, which is going to be inside of the classroom and trying to figure out um, how to put this together. So that's pretty basically what we're going to look at today. Um, and there are sort of one main aspect we're going to focus on, and that is the educational uh, educational modules. Um, and we're trying to make them educational model modules for any level. And that's kind of where we're looking to get uh, feedback is that by any level, it's, you know, obviously it's easy, you know, if, if somebody is putting it together, you you guys are end users and we, we haven't had this really tested in the real market yet. So this is what we're excited about, um, having the opportunity for people to who teach different levels of courses. You know, I'm not a teacher per se, so I, obviously I don't, I mean, it's gonna take that kind of thing to figure out okay, how, do, how the teachers respond to this and what are the, uh, the types of things that we could be looking at when we design um, these educational modules, how, what's the best way to design these modules? What are the areas that we can um, focus on to make it easier to to do while at the same time you know these as you can see these things are very flexible you're not necessarily tied to one exact point to point so we want to be able to teach general ideas and concepts so that teachers and communities can take those general concepts and create their own new concepts is what we'd like to do so we're trying to um, have that level of flexibility in the 
um, educational modules and sort of tools that we provide. Um, so with that, I'm going to pull this thing apart. So we'll take a two minute break or three minute break, and then we're going to then we're going to get into the actual um, the actual pulling together of this uh, of this of this system. So hold on just one second. Hey Becky. Becky, your camera's not it's like not connected. We can't see. But uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, oh. now it's working. Now it's working. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. There we go. Could I have a fellow maybe holding the mic? Because I'm the note taker. So is, can people see on the, whoops. Where did the other video go? Is that there? Okay, and then I need to like blow okay. that up, right? Yeah. Okay. I want it, I want that slide. Okay. Wait, where? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, hang on. Yeah, so I've got Now, what I'd like to do is, I'm going to try to not like over influence too much because I, because I, because you know, obviously I would like to see how you guys feel about putting these things together. And well, I've got a couple of, if you can go to the main, uh, to the main presentation, you'll see a, you'll see a couple of, of, of diagrams on how the radiation shield looks. But sort of based on these diagrams, you know, we can start putting things together. And that's sort of the main issue. Oh, some of that's not, we're not going to have those on. So, so you'll see. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
So we're trying to let the educators put this together as they would in the classroom. Oh. It looks like that might be already. Is that oh, it? This is to the battery. This is the battery oh, power. Okay. So there's one of these other. <laughs> Once the line is connected to the is now on the Can you see the hat if you need it? Yeah. Once the, the microcontroller is seated on the center hat, you can now use the growth cable. Is this the growth cable? Or is this, this is the growth cable. Okay. Thank you. 
<laughs> That's why all the cheat is here is just a, it's only the wire that goes through the Okay. Okay. So basically, the electronics are all whoops. The electronics are all inside of here that you guys um, put together. How did you guys feel the putting together? This is the first time we've sort of tested this in the <laughs> in the real life in the in the wild, right? One of my recommendations would be, in addition to the the, I think the the diagram is is fine, and if these are are not unique, then there wouldn't be any reason to print them. But if there's a for something like the cap, if it was if it was part of the CAD was printed with the number that it's the that it's one or it's whatever, that would make at least my students would be a little they would be able to figure it out a little better. We got that. We got all excited putting this together because we figured it out. Put it all together and we realized we didn't have the electronics in it because it doesn't have that as part of the so it looks like you're supposed to put that together and then they were putting the electronics together and then we realized we had to pull some things apart so they could so the integrate the was assembled, we so were able to do that right. if the entire thing was assembled we would not have been able to insert the electronics the way you had demonstrated which makes sense how that works so so how do you guys prefer when you're teaching a class do you prefer to like break people up into groups and like, because I think there are sometimes the teachers will say, well, these guys work on this piece, these guys over here. That works well. What you're saying is like, could, you could have an electronics group and a physical per group, but you have to have in your directions to make sure you don't, you, you stop at a certain point so that now put the electronics in because they've built it, you've done this, now put the whole thing together. Whereas it looked like we were just working like crazy, got it all done, and we realized, oops, they were done with that. We got to pull it apart again and let them do it. You know what I'm saying? Because the kids will do the same thing. I know because my wife says I'm the maturity of an eighth grader. So. And one of the things that I noticed with my students is 
you know, I used to teach a class of multi, you know, ability levels. So depending on the group of kids, I might need step by step, and in other groups, I might just say, here's some stuff, and then see what they come up with. So I think that it depends on the class a lot of times as far as how it would work. But I think for me, I would prefer, you know, do this first, do that first. That way I know how to teach them and then I can modify it based on what they can do. Yeah, one of the things I, I was going to pile on to because my, my partner and I, one of us was reading the directions, the other one was just slapping stuff together. And I think, <laughs> and I and I think, I will let you figure out which one was which. But I noticed that the other group was sort of looking a little bit and we were kind of looking around for hints, but I think some of the discovery part is that if they don't choose to do the steps the way they are and they want to figure it out, as long as it's, you know, that manufacturer that if it's in with, if it's a left-handed thing or a right-handed thing that they perfectly mirror so that there's no way of messing it up, mm -hmm. that would, the students who don't want to follow directions might get it accomplished anyway. And it's that discovery process that gets some of my lower end students excited. And the life lesson is always, you know, within there. But, you know, if it doesn't get together, you know, you know what happens when you've done something from Ikea, when it looks like. Um, yeah, I actually had a desk lamp and it was supposed to be a chair. But um, that is part of the dis process of discovery, too. So, you know, as long as this stuff, and it seems pretty indestructible, um, allows you, yeah, the... You know, there you go, there you go. And duct tape, yeah. So I think that, you know, some of these images, even just showing pictures and, and having them have a go at it is kind of fun, because then when you do all of this and you're like, we did it, and then there's no sensor inside. <laughs> it could be, yeah, could be kind of fun to see, yeah. He super glued his hands to his nose. Yeah, I've had that, you know. So <laughs> duct tape works well. But, you know, there's always, there used to be the peanut butter and jelly lesson. How do you put a peanut butter and jelly sandwich together? And, I mean, even to have them do this and then to have them write down the steps that they took as their discovery process is a really strong way to enforce not only that independent discovery, but that also the importance of following directions in a process for something to work. Yeah. So, so do you guys uh, work with the NGSS standards? And because um, I'm learning about, <laughs> I'm learning about how all of that works. And what do you guys think are some of the key sort of exercises or things that you could do inside the classroom with something like this to um, to work with the uh, NGSS standards? So, do you guys have any? And it also works for you. Also work with the NGSS standards too, or we have it for fourth and fifth grade. We use HMH science curriculum, and they have the different core standards for different things. And they do have um, design and discovery. We're on the engineering part at our school, and you have to come up with a criteria and constraints for fourth graders. And then their criteria would be it has to have a certain amount. It has to be able to fit in. A certain way, and no, you can't use super glue. <laughs> you have to figure out how to make it. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. As the non-science teacher in the room, um, why the shape for the radiation? Shape? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they and the and the reason why they call it, I mean, I guess there's a couple of things. So they're calling it a radiation shield. Uh, you know, the technical thing is not sunlight. They say solar radiation. Um, so what they're trying to do is they want to have it to be airy enough. So if you just put it inside of a box, the heat would stick in there and just, you know, and just make things over overheat overheat so you'd have too much heat. So you want to make it airy airy enough so that the air flows through the radiation shield. So that's why you have this sort of round shape and these sort of these sort of like things. So the air can flow inside of here. And then you have the screens on here so that you can actually keep the bugs out. So that's sort of the one practical thing because otherwise you'd have bees going in there and nesting and things. So basically you want to be able to catch the ambient sort of temperature, pressure and whatnot, but you want to have it in an enclosed enough area that's, that can do that without actually holding heat. 
you don't want wind cooling on it either. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I mean, it could be a honeycomb shape, and this is a good question because now one of the things you could say is, if you wanted to with the classroom, you could you the files, the three D printed files are available, and there are software that you can go in and re change the thing and say, what if we, what if we change the shape? Yeah. Yeah. So you can definitely work on that too. How does the accuracy of the sensors that you have compared to, say, a professional uh, weather station? And are there mistakes in this that you could make that would affect the accuracy? Then, so that might be a te teaching moment too. That's a very good question. So uh, it depends on the types of uh, teaching level you want to say. So if you wanted to go and say, okay, we want to make the most accurate weather station. So the first question would be, okay, where do we put it? And that actually impacts the accuracy by a lot. So if you had it sitting right outside your classroom window and there's a tree there and there's a building right there, you know, that might not be such an accurate answer because you're in the shade half the day and the building's in the way and there's all you're not sighting it very well. Um, so that's one thing. Now the accuracy of the instruments themselves are actually quite accurate. They're, you know, the sensors are fairly a standard type of sensors. Sensor technology in the last five, ten years have, you know, have gone really well. Um, some obviously some of the constraints in terms of extreme cold or certain extremes, it you know, it might be a little bit uh dodgy in those in those situations, like it'll rhyme up or or clam up if you're if it's too cold. But if we're not in Antarctica or someplace completely extreme, um it'll give you a very reasonable and a very functional answer and and it actually has um been tested um these particular sensors for the level of accuracy that they have. So they're actually fairly um, fairly accurate um, systems. It's just a really a matter of siding and maintenance um, of the of the of the system. What is the greatest amount of maintenance you have with this? Because we have a weather station in our school and I have to climb on the roof to clean the water trap out all the time. Yeah, that's a that's a good point too. Because the the rain gauges are take uh, quite a bit of maintenance because if it if especially if you're in Hawaii or someplace where where you have a lot of foliage, um, stuff blows into it and then you have to empty it out. But these radiation shields actually hold up pretty well. The um, the um, uh, radiation shield we had uh, with uh, at Marshall Field is like a test site that NCAR has. Um, it's been out there for a little over two years, and it's still, I mean, because we're using ABS plastic, it's still hold, it's still standing and holding up well. Um, uh, one of the things of why we want to have it as a modular sort of system is that, say, one piece breaks or it's a super windy day and this thing flies off, you'd be able to, like, print the different components, replace that component, and then, you know, you'll be able to, to, move, to move forward without having to replace the entire station. Does each, does each sensor on your stand work independently so that, like you said, if that blows off, it doesn't rip the wires out of, you know, does, it's like the old Christmas light thing, one goes out and everything goes out type. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because each node or each section has its own microcontroller. You see how small this microcontroller is? And then if you look at the, um, if you can grab that, that one, the, the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and versus this as a comparison, right? So this this is a whole entire computer. So this thing has an operating system. You can open Windows. You can surf the internet. You can play YouTube and everything on this. <laughs> right? If you had a monitor, yeah, it's like. <laughs> but this one, you could never do that because it only has a very finite amount of memory, and all its job is to do is to say, okay, I'm going to read the data off of this sensor, and I'm going to push that data to this spot. So it only does a very, you know, mundane, repetitive kinds of tasks. So this is what you call a microcontroller, and this is what you call a sort of a single board sort of computer. Is, um, is there, can, can you guys hear me over there? Is there, is, is, am I, is my audio working? You can hear me. Okay, yeah, I wanted to add to that, Ag, you know, because that was one of the, 
This is Keith. Uh, you know, Ag and I are partnering on this. Uh, we've been working on this for quite a bit. Um, um, I want to add to your point, and I want you know, I, I would like to say something with respect to the um, the you know educational value of, of what Ag is saying. So when we look at the, the microcontroller versus the um, Hi. yo Keith, yes. <laughs> can you can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes. Yeah, because I mean we can't hear you. Your mic is really low. Oh. Okay. Let's see. Um, is this any better? If I get if I get a little closer to my computer, is that better? No. Do you um, have? You know Are you on the I'll, phone? Yeah, I'll call in on the phone, and I guess I'll make my point. You, you continue, and I'll make my point in just a second. I'll call back. Oh, okay. Yeah. If he calls in, it'll be better. It might be better if you call in. Is that him? May I ask my question while we're waiting? Oh yes, of course. No, no problem. I wanted to. I, I'm sorry if you addressed this and I missed it. How much does the microcontroller cost, and how much does all of this cost to build? Okay, my question was, how much does the microcontroller cost, and then uh, I can find out about Raspberry Pi. But, and then also, how much does it cost to build the whole thing? That's a good question. So a Raspberry Pi costs thirty to thirty-five dollars. You can get them in at Walmart, for example. That's how much uh, those cost. It, it, is uh, this better? Yeah, that's better. Uh, Keith, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. We can hear you. I'm just answering a quick question on the cost okay. of the different components, and yep. I was explaining how you know my uh, Raspberry Pi costs you know um, thirty-five dollars. Microcontrollers actually cost less. They're between ten and fifteen dollars for a microcontroller. Uh, what's that? Uh, one, oh, those you have to order online, uh, and you, yeah. you can get a new egg or something like that. These these hats, um, they cost another what? They're like ten dollars. You get these wires for a dollar or so each. Uh, the microcontrollers are range between five and fifteen dollars, depending on how many things or features you want to have. Yeah. And, you yeah. can hook up, as you see, there are different things in there, are different slots. You can hook up multiple um, sensors to one thing. So if you look at one node all together, um, you know you're, you're you're talking around a little around sixty dollars for uh, for uh, for a single node. Yeah, well, the printing you might have to if you print yourself. That's a different issue because um, the printing. It depends on if you have, and that's why we were asking about maker spaces. If you have an access to a maker space, the printing takes time, and you know, and filament to, to print. So that print by itself might cost you thirty thirty dollars or so. Uh, quite a bit less. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, 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 I'd like to add to that. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Keith. Yeah, I was going to add to that. So, so on the printing, um, you know, as many of you know. Uh, you can get a um, rather decent 3D printer these days for under $300. And, um, you know, the filament, uh, there are different qualities of filament. You can get a um, kind of middle-of-the-road average quality filament that, uh, you know, most people, PLA, which is most people, well, what most people use for most applications. Um, you know, you can get a spindle for under $20, and a $20 spindle would probably be enough to produce three of what you see on that table, maybe a little bit more. Um, you know, so so with the cost of 3D printers rapidly, you know, um, declining, uh, you know, for a couple hundred bucks and, you know, less than 50 bucks in materials, you could get... Um, what you see on the table for sure, uh, if not more than that. Uh, but I, I was going to address also um, Ag, the conversation about microcontrollers. So one of the one of the questions that I hear at least is, you know, okay, you know, first off, 
you know, cost is important and we want to be sensitive to that. But the other thing that I hear is, you know, the complexity of what you see, you know, which, um, you know, uh, Ag, I think, mentioned a little bit, you know, we've, we've, we've been working quite a bit on trying to reduce the complexity so that we can get to these conversations much more quickly, you know, and say, oh, look, you know, there's data, <laughs> you know, there's, there's something happening here. Um, but the microcontroller versus Raspberry Pi, you know, I, I, I want to add to the distinction between these two and that they are not mutually exclusive. So one of the goals of, of breaking these things into individual, you know, um, uh, self-contained nodes is that if you wanted to go down the path of programming a Raspberry Pi to produce the measurements from that instrument, um, you could most certainly do that. And that could be an advanced module in a, in a classroom. I could see for sure a computer or computing or computing, computer engineering type uh, high school course where you decide instead of using microcontrollers, you use Raspberry Pi and you learn a little bit about operating systems, you learn a little bit about Linux, you learn a little bit about, you know, all the other things, the flavor that go that goes with uh, the single board SBC, single board computers that the Raspberry Pi ecosystem represents. So that's one of the things that, you know, I wanted to just add to the conversation a little bit, Ag, because the as as we are sort of developing the ideas behind this, the strategy is to think about how this scales in multiple directions and dimensions. You know, uh, if you want to spend more time engineering, you could say, is there a honeycomb design that may be more interesting to develop to compare and do real experiments, right? I mean, you could say we have design A, which is what came out of the box, and we created a honeycomb design B with the same sensors and, um, you know, uh, hook it up and, and compare your measurements. Yeah, I think that's good. And we had another question here. Um, one of the questions uh, that you had was QC and calibration. And if you're not a meteorologist, um, how does that work? And so this is one of the reasons why um, we have gone to sort of these digital uh, versions of the sensors, as opposed to, um, you know, for example, the wind. Uh, wind is basically a spinning system here, or wind direction. And say, if you want to look at one direction, the first thing we have to do, if you did not have a digital compass, is you would have to try to figure out what what north is. And you'd have to make sure you're perfectly calibrated to that before you, you know, when you set up your weather station. But if you have a digital compass that actually already knows where north is, um, that saves you from having to, you know, do all of that calibration. Again, with, uh, with the respect to your uh, wind speeds, if you have it uh, calibrated uh, digitally, digitally uh, to understand how fast an accelerometer, basically, if you're spinning this fast, this is what wind speed is. That, you know, is a much easier calibration to do. It doesn't require direct calibration and and and, and fiddling with you know with the Hall effect sensor. Yeah, it, it stays with, that's a good question. It does stay within, because these are digital sensors, they do stay within a sort of calibration range, but there is some drift over, there will be over time with these types of low cost sensors. They they are, it wouldn't, it, for most practical purposes, especially temperature, pressure, relative humidity, wind speed, wind direction, they're, they're gonna be within reason of, you know, they're not gonna be like 30 to 20, 10 degrees off of like a huge number. You might see a little bit of drift. And, and, and oh, we approach this as a just because of wear and tear. Yeah, I mean, no, I, if, if we approach yeah. this as a science experiment, let's say that we as ESIP got you know the whole piece of keyboard <laughs> to, to buy into these, and every school did this as a project. If every school did this as a project and decided to put one of these temperature sensors up, and we wanted to see that whole mess, how do we who QCs it to decide that? that sensor may not be reporting properly? So that's a really good question. And uh, QC, especially if you were doing it at scale, becomes a data science um, issue. 
um, there is a, a, a system when I was showing you that modeling, there is a, a what you call uh, the fancy term they use is data assimilation. And part of data assimilation is when you're taking the data and you're putting it into the models is that they do QC and quality control of it. So they're looking at the, uh, they're kind of like analyzing it and figuring out whether that data is drifting warmer or drifting colder or what some of the issues might be um, or if there's spurious kind of data points that, I may, that may be coming out. They're, they're basically taking that and, and filtering those types of systems out, especially when you have that many stations. Is it part of the this? Let's call this a program. I don't know where it's going yet, but let's call it a program. Is there some kind of feedback mechanism that you envision where, for instance, our school, if his eighth grade class or my ninth grade class has done this in two different parts of Maryland, and you know, is he going to get feedback that his sensor has gone off scale and he needs to do another lesson to build a new one? We we what I think the main thing now is to build that sort of framework. And one of the things we're doing is using chords is to have an open data framework and to have sort of a fair, you know, the findable and reusable, interoperable, and I forgot what the A is, accessible um, sort of system. And that means, you know, having it available in a place like, um, like chords, because a lot of that type of information is to allow someone whether it be a university or a teacher or us as a as a sort of as the I don't even know what you want to call it. I wouldn't say managers like proctors or the, <laughs> the 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 rig leaders of this situation to uh to basically look at some of that data and say, okay, here are ways that we can help improve and provide these sort of frameworks to make it easier to to manage a network like this. be able to recalibrate this ourselves though. Let's say we had good sensors, handheld like there's some good wind, wind speed sensors. I could go outside, re take the reading, and then see what it said on there. And if it's off by five miles per hour, can we recalibrate the sensor then? The, the sensor itself you would have to replace. So the one thing here is that you have this nice little re, re, re plug and play thing. And that's the thing that's nice about these sensors is that if it does get old or a year from now or two years from now, you can just pull this sensor out, plug in a new sensor, and off you go. Um, so, you know, if you want, I yeah, mean, uh, uh, you know, would be, that would be the main way to calibrate it is you just replace it. I'll add one more thing to that, Ag, if you want. Um, it depends on the sensor. There are some sensors that you can um, pro reprogram their uh, calibration and um, but it varies I don't I can't think of any ones that we're currently using that that's possible but but there are some that you can do that I uh, know Mike had a question too I was just going to speak to this data use kind of thing so cords it's important to note cords is an earth cube funded project so it was a National Science Foundation funded project for real-time um, time series data so it's it looks at things pretty generally and atmospheric sciences is one of them but the thing in terms of getting the access to the data, it, uh, it's, e it's easy as writing a Python script. You have to do a URL query to your chords portal that contains your data or download a spreadsheet in, you know, of the, you know, some time period of data. So hopefully it's very simple you know, kinds of data to use. And so we always envision uh, more advanced things happening on the, on the user side. Okay, I'll go and run this algorithm on the, on the data, you know, a, a data quality algorithm, whatever that might be. And every, every discipline has a little bit of difference in that. And then, um, you know, so make, make that access very easy for the persons that are managing their, th those sites to do on their own. Um, the other thing I'd say is uh, Paul Casera, who was the designer of the, rigid, the older uh, 3D pause printer, was working with the WMO on, on, on certifying this at a lower level. Um, there's some lower level certification, I can't remember what it was called, um, to, to make sure it's calibrated and, and it, you know, it's measuring things properly when it's initially installed. Um, and, and then that, that would be a WMO I can't remember, Keith. Can you what the name of the certification was? But that's yeah. Yeah, I don't remember yet, but I know what you're yeah. Just got that question. Uh, the question was, is it good for government agencies? So now the National uh, Weather Service has uh, they use these WMO, what World Meteorological Organization um, standards, and it, there's a whole set of standards that you're supposed to meet to to meet World Meteorological Organization things 
the, the goal of this is not per se to meet the WMO standards because those are like ten thousand dollar weather stations, whereas you know, or or more like Davis weather stations or Visala, and they're they're built to be tough. They can last through hurricanes, and you can put them down in Antarctica, and they'll last through the winter and all this other stuff. So that's what those WMO stations are. However, the you know they the, those stations, for example, wind speed might be up to like 0.1 meter per second uh, accuracy um, and stable on that <laughs> line, whereas this one might be you know 0.5 meters per second accuracy. So you're not quite obviously you're not even you're not close to that level of accuracy, but to to be able to do science and be able to collect data and see what trends are happening. Um, that you can then correct for, you, you can certainly use this sort of station, but, you know, the National Weather Service may not particularly use this as their gold standard, but you could still use these to integrate into models and, and, and to, you know, work with and understand what's going on with the weather. Must you go through cords to get the data? No, you don't have to. I think um, what CORDS does, though, is is sort of provides a geoscience context in things like it lo it, it uh, records the location of this instrument. You know, some of the some of the IoT platforms are proprietary, and you can't get access to the data. That that's something that Ag mentioned. Yeah, that's a CORDS display. So we kind of add um, geoscience metadata. We use GeoJSON, GeoCSV. So you don't have to, though. That sounds great. Then my next question for you is: um, Cords is prepared to handle ten thousand more uh, feeds. It's a it's a cloud uh, program. You can you're gonna get an Amazon account the first year. You can get an Amazon account for free and and have and set up a Cords portal with that. Yeah, you set up your own uh, cloud instance, but it's also it's also run, run you know runs under Docker, so you can you know, move it around. Oh, yeah. uh, can you, yeah. uh, I guess cool. you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, you have the ability to run records on your own station, or I think we're looking at working with either INCAR or text, uh, you know, some other groups to have a, a community po uh, cords portal so that if, uh, if, you, if you're a teacher, we can say, hey, you want to add your station to this, to this existing cords portal, then you'd be able to see everybody else's and other people's classrooms. Um, so there are different ways you can do that. You might have a group where like a Colorado Teachers Association might have their own little port, portal so that they can track what's going on in their community. So there's a lot of different options that you can have, but the key is, is that it's quite flexible to adopt to uh, and scalable to, to those things. So, yeah. So and one other thing I'd, I'd to add to that is to say, um, you know, you could run a course portal on a Raspberry Pi. So like the new Pi B4s or, you know, the, the quad core with four gigs of RAM would be plenty sufficient to be able to run a quartz portal on a computer that fits in your pocket. Yeah. and, and We've been and, trying to get it on a cell phone as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you can run it on anything and then you can also have it like uh, Mike was saying on the, on the TAC uh, stream, uh, uh, on the TAC, the Texas Computing, Supercomputing Center, they have some uh, resources, cloud resources that teachers can use. Yep. Thanks. Uh, so these very technical questions have been really good. And I guess I wanted to reflect back to our teachers who are here. Sorry, my ears just popped. Um, you know, so you're hearing the technical part and we, we did some hands on. And I'm guess I'm wondering, it's like knowing what you know now, what would it you know what would it take for you guys to implement this like is this a scary proposition is it like yeah i think we could do this or with more support or i need a server that this you know i need some place for this data to go because i'm not going to do that etc so anyway i wanted to reflect these out question would would it be okay to use it for a part i mean would you be okay with us doing something like this but only doing because i use one quarter where i do weather then I'm expected to move on to the next thing. So I wouldn't constantly, I may not constantly all year long, every day, or, you know, Does be setting up. Need yeah. My own, need. in that case, yes. Yeah. So yeah. This, compared to buying a brand new weather station through some automated weather sources and stuff like that, you could build one every year and 10 years from now still be saving money. Yeah. 
So. How about anyone else? That's scary. Um, I one of my concerns is, and and again, lack of knowledge. Um, where does this go from here? Um, does there need to be a designated computer in the school that's retrieving this information? Um, and then what kind of software is required for it to be read? Because again, that has to also through a test bed, through the county, as far as whether it's a drain on our system wide, you know, limited resources for the web that went down twice last week. Um, we have Wi Fi in the school for like, um, those that have laptops and for Chromebooks and things like that, um, as to whether or not the system would allow us to put something like this onto the school's Wi-Fi would be my first question, I think, and then running any software, because you're talking about something that to me sounds like software, um, and if that, ha that has to go through a test bed um, and get checked. Now, if it's cloud and it's not something where they're downloading software, that sounds like it might do a little better, um, but there are a lot of restrictions that we have to follow as far as that technology piece, and that's the piece like, this is easy, I've already emailed my tech ed teacher and say, I want to build a weather, weather station. I know that they work with Raspberry Pi. I have the funding to purchase everything that would need to be purchased. We have so much filament <laughs> from when we first got it and didn't know how much we would use that like all of that is not a problem. My, my only concern is, where does this go? What are the requirements for the next step that I need to be able to go back to the Board of Ed and say, we want to do this and this is what we need? So I, I wanted to make a quick question or a quick point, I guess, would be, you know, one thing is looking at how schools, and that's a very good um, thing, which I obviously don't know the answer to, but if uh, one sort of baseline to look at is how schools or your school or your program deal with Raspberry Pis. So if you got a Raspberry Pi, would you be allowed to connect it to the Wi-Fi or would you not be allowed to connect it to the Wi-Fi? Are you allowed to upgrade, update the software on the Raspberry Pi or not? So if they allow you to have a Raspberry Pi, then they certainly would this has less information, i.e. this does less work than the Raspberry Pi does, a microcontroller. So, so you should be able to, I mean, if you do one and you say, okay, we've got that, a, a, a microcontroller is, for lack of a better term, not as smart as a Raspberry Pi. So that's one thing yeah. that's kind of nice is that this will actually do less work and there's a less, a smaller security risk relative to, um, relative to your IT systems. This is a whole computer. If I get on this, I can actually do some damage because I have a command line and I can actually tell it to do things. Whereas this thing only has like eight, like a tiny bit of like 32 bits of memory. So it doesn't have like enough memory to even do anything really. Um, Uh, yes, uh, he he asked if this microcontroller can send us the data or send him or the classroom the data if they had like a special computer uh, or a computer that could receive it. Yeah, it can do that. So these microcontrollers have little Wi-Fi connectors on there and can send the data directly to within an internal network. So um, and it doesn't have to speak outside of the network. Oh, Ag, you can add to that, that that if you know if that was an issue, you could set the cords portal up directly inside of the network as well, so that it's actually only accessible from within the school's network. Just just so you know, you you could completely block the cords portal if you set an instance up locally from ever seeing the outside world. So, and this brings up another point. Um, one thing, good feedback that you guys provided, because one thing that we need to do is probably provide some of this information to make it easier for you to go back and um, get, what did you say? It was like some kind of test bed? Okay. Um, has to go through test bed because, you know, we only have so much space and size in our network. And if this is going to be a drain on the network, they're not going to allow it to go through. Um, 
things like that have to go through. So whatever type of software we might need to install on a computer to read the data would need to be noted. Whether I needed to designate a computer um, would also be something that I would need to know. Like, can I just have this on my computer while I'm working or do I, can I tap into it when I want to? Or do I need to have a designated um, system that's reading that information? So some kind of summary for a test bed and give you options, like this is what the issues are for a test bed would be useful for a teacher because I, I didn't know this. So this was <laughs> this is good to know. Are we running? Um, let me think of anything else. Like, yeah, I mean, as far as security goes, I mean, that's one of the number one things is, you know, we have kids that are way smarter than we are and they do very malicious things, on, you know, just because they can. Um, so that's a scary thing, but it's something that we need to be concerned about, making sure that kids aren't using that to go somewhere else that they shouldn't be that you know might be dangerous for them. So these are all factors that we have to think about when we worry with technology. The, uh, as I was thinking about this, that I, I see this as, as a cross-curricular activity for sure, that between the science, between the engineering guys, the computer science guys, which are separate in our school, and then the and then myself as a science teacher plus and and it's not just my earth sciences that will use it biology could use it others could use it we can the nice thing about this and, and i would say that it, if as i was thinking through this because of the the not being wmo compliant um i would deliberately not hard connect it to anything i would deliberately keep it as a standalone device much like that sitting over there where it's just weather on a stick and I would record the data on the Pi or, you know, if, if the processor was there, just record it, bring it back for math to analyze and plot and chart. They have requirements, they have, they have standards, right? The engineering guys could, could build it, the science guys could code it, you know, and then, or not science guys, the, uh, the computer science guys could code it. And then we could look at the data from the science perspective. And I think that because, and the reason I say that is that for us to have lost our WMO quality sensors, if I have this and suddenly I can print this for less than $200, then they'll say, well, you can print like 10 of them for less than $2,000. Why should I buy you this $10,000 piece of gear? And quite frankly, I still think that for the, for the students to feel not just like micro scientists, like this is a lab, but they feel like they're connected to their, they're connected to the world I think we still need the WMO sensor. But if you did even connect this to the, to the network where it's kind of standalone on its own or it's just reporting out via the wireless to your network, I could easily see this even outside of the correct, the specific content time frame in your curriculum that, you know, I could see this thing constantly reporting and people are like, well, how cold is it out? Well, it says it on this, on this repeater that I have just sitting outside my classroom. They could always come to room 511 and see what the temperature is. And I should also mention real quick is that, you know, not all stations are WMO stations. You do whether the, you have mesonets too that are, are, are useful. Right, right. So they certainly yeah, can, but yeah, but I get your point in terms of. I would not want somebody to put this in. Most of my administration, most of my administration, including the superintendent, does not think the weather station is important. Mm -hmm. So as a result, if I had anything that looked, smelled, you know, quacked like a duck, they're going to say, well, that's your, there's your weather station. You don't need a new one. You don't need a, a WMO one, like a big, huge one. The full, full one. So uh, this is <laughs> so Joseph Bell from USGS. This is really fascinating. Um, and it's, all these questions are something that the survey is struggling with, security, right, not being the standard. Uh, one of the things, just if I can kind of in my mind, hit a couple of topics. You spoke about calibrations, right? You can use your WMO as a ch calibration check. So what what am I observing versus my standard? Right, you can use that as a standard proxy. Um, a couple of other things, how the cross discipline comes in. You're you're not behind a black box anymore. You're in the black box. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what does that mean? There's a number of different proprietary algorithms that go into monitoring equipment. You know, all of them are doing some aspect of filtering. All of them are doing some aspect of a running window mean. You, you can create these, right? And you can see the difference between what it happens when I turn this on every five minutes and take an observation 
versus what happens when I turn this on every five minutes and take 20 observations in 20 seconds and then do small stats on that data, right? This gets at how do I know if my weather station is working great? I can have a running line of variability, right? <clears throat> in this non-contact sense with temperature, if you will, nothing really happens to temperature probes. They just go bad, right? So if you, if you integrate this into your program where you're building these um, algorithms that take a variability of the observation, you can monitor your variability as a time series. What does it look like through time as that variability starts to increase? Well, <clears throat> maybe it's the heat exchange properties of the thermal in, in the sensor, the thermal properties breaking down in the sensor because they do degree. So you can see this over time. Um, it's really fascinating stuff. This is an awesome thing. Um, one of the things that I wanted, I did ask uh, Shelly earlier. Shelly, yes? Yes. yes. Um, you know, what is the domain of your weather station, right? You, you mentioned particulates. Well, <clears throat> what if this is going on to somebody's property that has a stream? Or, um, you know, a school that has a stream running through it, can it be a depth sensor? Can it be an optical sensor that looks at turbidity? Right, so, so this is huge. And, you know, on the other side of it too, with data exchange and, and kind of, if you will, cross-pollinating time series of quality, um, Weather Underground is a fantastic place for open source data, right? And, and so now your company isn't paying for anything. You're basically using um, their advertisement to host your data. And a couple of things with that, you know, you spoke about connectivity. You don't have to be connect connected to weather on the ground. You can do uploads, right? And you can see your data in that sense. So, and, and that's an ability to retrieve it. So I'm, I'm gonna stop there. So thank you. Yeah, I, I actually, I'm glad I let you go first because mine's kind of a follow on to that. And so one of the, two other ways to think about this too is beyond just the individual school level is look at your community level. And this could be a good starting uh, career training, you know, vocational centers as, as your whole community looks at how you build a weather observing network for your community. Then you've got buy-in, you've got someone working with the schools, but also you're building the whole community's, you know, awareness. Another thing is um, NASA is actually doing a study for the drone industry, UAS industry, to look at what weather observations are needed locally to, in order to fly drones safely. And so the, the, just the future of what weather is going to be in the future is going to be expanding. So there may be economic opportunities in communities to have their own weather observing networks. The other thing too is that the other thing that people are looking at is does everything have to be at a WMO standard in order to be useful? It's, you know, WMO standards are the, the gold standard, but for local, you know, decision making, can you, you know, can you work with something that's not quite that level, but it's a little more inexpensive so that everybody can use it and it's more readily available. So I'm, I'm just pointing out that there may be other uh, business cases for this kind of device beyond the school education, although that's extremely important and it would be a good to connect all of these dots as this goes forward. Can I add one one thing to that? Uh, uh, it, 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 We're all talking at libraries and community libraries, yeah. uh, another space yeah. uh, educators can use, but also the wider community can um, can have these types of instruments as well. Yeah. Can I add one, one more thing to the point that was just made about the whether this is? Can, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, the, the point about whether this is WMO certified and that kind of thing, I want to add a couple couple things real quickly. We're using the same sensors that were used in the original 3D pause sands, the wind, and the uh, uh, the uh, uh, anemometer and wind vane. So sands, those two, we, we've gone digital where they were using analog. I would suspect that if we could if we could we we'll build some claim that you know the sensors, the digital sensors would last long enough, then we could probably get some sort of certification. So, you know, if they were pursuing certification, we're using the same sensors in most every other part of the system. The other thing I was going to say was, um, I absolutely, one of the more exciting parts of of a, you, you, your comment about you know community driven, you know com community based weather monitoring and that kind of thing is that, you know, that is one of our uh, central, you know, ideas here is that can they be useful with, you know, without being WMO server? Absolutely. And I would say that, you know, the quality of the measurements are, are going to be there and certainly are in the zone of what, what one would expect for some, from something professional. But the other thing is that as these, as these projects become more integrated into the way people think about their communities, 
you know, uh, our vision, or at least, you know, from an education perspective, is there would be projects that allow sensors to be built for the kinds of monitoring and observation that would be relevant to individual communities. And that, to me, is where the most exciting part of this lies, quite honestly, because, you know, it does give that, that you know, it does allow one to develop the skills necessary and to understand some of the uh, issues involved in, in these types of uh, projects and this, this type of data. No, I was going to piggyback off of what she said, and then he already answered the question um, or my comment about intergenerational um, communities working on those type of things and being not just in public libraries, but at rec centers because seniors and youth go to these centers and they're curious about their um, neighborhood, just like um, the citizen website showed that Maryland is having a drought. And so some of the students like, well, why is there a drought? Why do we have snow and so much, but at the same time, they see the reservoir go down. These units that you have would be perfect for everyone in the community to be together to find out what's happening. It's the same thing. So, so we got a couple of minutes left. Um, if anyone, like, I think part of the ESIP thing this conference was talking about, takeaways and things like that. Um, so if there's any comments on along those lines, let's take the last couple of minutes to address that. Thank you. Um, I, I, I am just so tickled by this. It is so empowering. I have my own community need that I'm interested in it for. Um, I live in unincorporated Boulder County, not far from the Foothills Lab, and we are dealing with um, pollution from um, fracking and then also pollution from aviation. And it would be just thrillingly empowering to put some of these up and, and be able to gather data and community building, and I think lots of people would get behind this. So, and oh, uses around the world, and it, uh, it's thrilling. Your assignment. <laughs> well, I was just wondering is because you have the Raspberry Pi unit here, could you attach that to a receiver of some sort and have the micro, whatever controller you called it, I think? Send send us the data Wi-Fi so we don't have to get on our school's Wi-Fi. Okay. Yes. Oh, just yeah. And put a USB yeah. port in it. Yeah. Put it in your um, computer. And load it to what? What did you say? It's going through uh, cords. Send it right to cords, and you don't have to actually go through because that's going to be in our county too. They're going to make me do all jump through all kinds of hoops. Yeah, that's absolutely um, easy to do. The other thing I'd say is this data is so low bandwidth you know we're talking about a little string of data every second so it's not going to be the type of thing that impacts your network in any way you're not even going to notice it that's one important thing yeah 10 megabytes a month so we're talking about really tiny quality quantities of data the other thing i'd say is https is built in so a secure connection is built into so that usually satisfies the security people when we tell them that yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just want to say, too, I think you guys are doing a good job of thinking of the end user first. You're not building a weather station and then trying to promote that. You're thinking of how are people going to use it? How are they going to get the data? How do, how do they want to modify it? So you all deserve a lot of credit for you know thinking of the big picture from the very beginning. Thank you for showing up. We, we, that's that's why, we're, why we're doing this. And then, so one final thing that I would say to add to it is this term fit for purpose, right? When, when it's 100 degrees outside and you have to know that it's 100 degrees, then if it's 99.9 .9 or 100.3, does it really matter, right? If, if, if you need 100.00 because you're in industry, then it matters. But if you're advertising to people that it's, it's hot as heck outside or it's, it's cold and blustery like today, it's that fit for purpose. Uh, what, you know, just to bring the surveys experience and exploration out right now is, you know, we, we have a very strict policy of instrumentation and what goes out and for what purpose. However, when we're looking at an upper ridge line where um, catastrophic flooding could start, we don't need to know that it's 4.6 feet. We just need to know there's four feet of water coming, right? So, so that can start to trigger some of the other more advanced instrumentations to pick up ground vibrations, velocities, um, and, and all that stuff. So it's, it's an aspect of fit for purpose monitoring, and it has its place. 
So thank you. Great everybody. point. One, one of the other community things you can do with this, I know we do this on our community with some weather stations, is sports. Okay, so mm. Saturday, the commissioner has to find out whether they're allowed to play a soccer match that morning because it's going to be X temperature, X humidity. This could be a great service for them as well. Yep. That's, that, that's great. Yep. He said you would have a lightning detector at every field. And you can add a microphone and see who's winning the game. I love the idea of having something like that that is something that the kids could actually build themselves. Um, and uh, I believe it was said that it's um, you're using your engineering students, you're using your computer science students, you're using your science students. Um, possibly your math students, and, and you can really bring it across all the curriculums. And I think that that is the wealth of, of the product, um, is to show them, one, that you can do something so simple and come up with quite a, um, an outcome based off of that. Um, and as long as we can get back through the barriers, I think it's a fantastic resource um, at low cost, but it also shows them that simple coding and, and simple understanding of some of these materials is something that can really go far and it's something that might open a door to a career field that they weren't necessarily considering that they sort of found that putting this together and taking it apart is definitely something that they're interested in and there are opportunities for that. One more comment, and, but, and how you mentioned the different students, we also don't want to leave out the uh, communications and the art and the other areas, because when you have this data, how do you then communicate it to the newspaper and the, and the school and the other uh, students who are not necessarily scientists, but also have really useful skills of making policy or influencing policy and decisions and things like that. Some folks have done some really cool things with visualizations and rhythm and temperature uh, data, right? So, so I think this was at ESIP summer, uh, 20, yeah, 2019, right? There was a, a really cool presentation on um, climate change and temperature in, think, ice. that's right, glacier ice, and, and they're receding, and it was fantastic. So. Another teacher comment. <laughs> the comment was, um, again, talking about how easily it would be used in your classrooms here, but what about the simplicity of it that it can be used all over the world? It could be global because a lot of the students have to study thing. I mentioned that my, our students are um, Mandarin speakers and Spanish speakers and English speakers within the school and the teachers come from all over the world. So the students would be able to use, this is not um, that complex, but it would be simple for them to use. And then as far as the music part that you were saying, even the, the sound when it starts to rain can be put to music and they would be able to transmit that and share all of that information. So, you know, here we are at the ESIP conference and we hear about the data people and the science people. Then you go back to your place of business and you hear about the engineering people and the data science people and the math people. Um, I think it's a little, a, a microcosm of what we need you know, in the sciences. And, you know, we're having, we're facing this issue of trying to keep software engineers interested in doing science software engineering, not working for Google and all these. Um, and, and one way to do that is to show them what it's really like. Guess what? You get to work with this cool electronics. You get to work on data quality and science data that you can actually see. So uh, that's the real cool thing for me is that as early as we, as we can get kids to realize that, that it's a whole picture. That weather station is, a, you know, components of engineering, components of software, components of data. I think that's great. Okay, so I would like to thank everyone again for for coming. Uh, sorry, we went a little bit over time, but the time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> that was really quick. Uh, you guys made it. Yeah, this was excellent, and and I hope we'll be in touch and we'll talk soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs>